I'll give you about five more seconds to vote on how comfortable you are with delivering an Ignite talk. All right. Looks like most of you have submitted answers, and it looks like most of you are somewhat comfortable with the format going in. So we will see how this how this might change over the course of the next few minutes. So now let's get into the details of giving an Ignite talk, and for that, I will allow Darren to take it away. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Shira. Um, I also want to say I noticed in the first question about people who've seen or delivered a night talk, I think there were about six or seven of you that said yes. Um, I'm going to ask you to chime in and share some of your tips um, and best practices um, based off of your experience um, at, during part of this presentation. So be at the ready to type in your, your tips and, and best practices when we get to that part of the presentation. And then I also saw in the second um, poll, there were about 11, 12, 13 of you that were in the somewhat comfortable category of uh, being able to design and deliver an Ignite talk. Um, hopefully by the end of this, we will move you a little bit further down the spectrum and, and really make you feel comfortable. So. Okay, now go. <laughs> So the goal of this webinar is to set you all up for success as Ignite Talk presenters at the Global Education Conference. So I'm actually going to use the Ignite Talk format for this webinar to share and model best practices, tips, guidance, and research that will make your Ignite Talk effective and engaging. So as you all know, on April 6th, 600 people from across the education sector will descend on Washington, D.C. to explore a variety of technical areas through the lenses of four overarching themes, coordination and collaboration, evidence-based decision-making, self-reliance, and systems strengthening. So as the education sector, we will no doubt show up with the important content, information, and stories that can address these themes. But we also need to show up with the pedagogy that the research on education tells us actually generates learning results. So research tells us that when presenting information, retention is increased by almost 30% when graphics are used, text is limited, the conversation is prepared, and job aids or handouts are provided. However, despite all this, we are still subject to long, drawn-out presentations that put people to sleep, or when faced with time limitations, presenters speak extra fast in an attempt to cram in as much information as possible. And as a result, you all know learning suffers. So we know how to do better, and that's where the Ignite Talk comes into play. Ignite Talks, which are sometimes referred to as pachakacha, which is Japanese for chit-chat, is a 20-slide PowerPoint presentation with each slide appearing on the screen for 20 seconds before moving on to the next slide. So in total, this makes for a presentation that is exactly 6 minutes, 40 seconds long. Now, Ignite Talks are not new. The format's been around since the early 2000s, and they've been utilized at events, conferences, meetings, informal gatherings all over the world. And so we actually learned at the start of this webinar that some of you have actually delivered Ignite Talks yourself. So as a result, some of you may be going into your Ignite Talk with excitement and confidence. Others of you may be reluctant or skeptical. So if you do have experience giving or seeing an Ignite Talk, please take a moment right now, as this presentation continues, to type a comment in the chat window sharing one tip for designing or delivering a great Ignite Talk. And just have them keep coming in as we go through the presentation. So as folks type in their comments, let's return to the four elements that the research tells us make for an effective presentation. Again, those are graphics, limited text, 
preparation, and handouts. And I'm going to provide some do's and don'ts for each of these elements. So when it comes to graphics, do find and use high quality images that represent the point that you're trying to make on any given slide. So as you know, a picture can speak a thousand words. So let the images do some of the talking for you or amplify what you're saying. And in fact, the truest form of an Ignite Talk actually involves only having one image per slide. What you want to avoid is having too many graphics on any one slide. So remember, the slide is only up and visible for 20 seconds at a time. And so the human brain needs time to take in and process what it's seeing. So it's better to be selective and choose the most effective image rather than using too many. When it comes to text, self-edit. Um, if you feel like you absolutely need text on a slide, you do not need to write full sentences. Instead, pull out and highlight keywords and phrases that punctuate what you're saying. Also with limited text, um, you know, this is a general rule, just don't rely on the screen to do what your voice should be doing. So believe it or not, listening to your voice and watching you speak is far more interesting than reading words on a screen. So if there is a lot of written content that you want to share, that's where handouts come into play. Um, uh, handout, let me skip here. here. Anyway, um, handouts, um, you know, if there is more content that you want to share, you should think about an infographic or an article or a blog post or some other knowledge product that participants can use to dive deeper and get more details. And so our goal as conference organizers is to make digital versions of those handouts available um, online, in addition to your presentation slides. So when it comes to preparation, um, some tips for preparing are to train yourself to speak at a comfortable pace that an audience um, can follow. And that means that in 20 seconds, you should speak anywhere from 35 to 50 words. And so this rule provides an easy way for you, again, to self-edit and refine what you want to say during each slide of your talk. Also on preparation, we highly recommend organizing a couple of practice sessions with your office colleagues to get their feedback and to get your timing down. So again, remember, each slide is only on the screen for 20 seconds. So what you're saying needs to sync up and pace uh, with that rhythm. And it helps, actually, to think of this just as much as a performance as it is a presentation. So to get you started, um, we are going to share with you, and there's some links provided in the online resources box on your screen with an Ignite Talk uh, design template. And this is a simple tool that you can use to write your script and organize it alongside your slide. Um, and so what you see on the screen is the outline of this very Ignite talk that I'm delivering right now. Also know that um, your Ignite talk um, is grouped with two to three other Ignite talks that are focused on a similar theme. And based on the configuration of the conference venue, your session will have at least 75 people in the audience seated theater style. And that can pose some challenges, but rest assured, because TRG, um, Training Resources Group, um, that's supporting the conference, will be providing a professional facilitator in each Ignite Talk session. And they're going to make sure that the session starts and ends on time, that the audience is engaged before, in between, and after each talk, and that there are seamless transitions from one talk to the next. So all you have to focus on is is your performance and your presentation, not so much the facilitation. So to conclude, we hope that you feel more confident now in your ability to design and deliver an effective Ignite Talk. And we have no doubt that you all will come to the conference excited and ready to give the best Ignite Talk ever. So end scene, um, and we'll, we'll open it up to, uh, to questions. So if you have questions at this point, please type them into the chat. Um, while I'm waiting for that, while we're waiting for that, 
I do want to point out that we did get a couple of comments from people that have either delivered or seen at Ignite Talk. Uh, one from Maria Brindlemeyer from Youth Power Learning, who said rehearsing is key. Um, Darren, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit while people are typing their questions. Yeah, no, so Maria wrote that in? Uh, yeah. Maria, yeah. Yeah, Maria, thanks for, yeah, just kind of reinforcing that point. Um, I think one of the great things about the Ignite Talk is because it is scripted and timed, it does necessitate practice. And every time people practice what they're going to present, it ends up being a better learning experience. I think oftentimes if we know our content, we have a lot of confidence. Oh, I can show up and I'll, I'll wing it. I'll just speak off the cuff. Um, more often than not, that, that's not the best approach. So we definitely strongly encourage, based off of the research, based off of people's personal experience, that if you rehearse um, your presentation, you're going to walk into that room you're going to feel more confident. You're going to hit it out of the park. Um, and again, learning will will um, will thrive. So definitely practice in front of a mirror, in front of friends, colleagues. Uh, highly recommended. Great. Thank you, Darren. Uh, we also had a comment from John Gillies. Uh, thank you, John, for your comment, who said uh, the, the one of the keys to Ignite Talks is to have a very tight, very focused message. And I agree. I, I think that you're right on the point here. Um, we, we do have some questions coming in, so thank you for those that are, that are typing. Um, I am collecting them, and I think we can start with um, Doug Perkins, who has a question for Julene. Uh, he asks, do you know yet how many will attend so we know how many handouts to print? And Julene, I will let you take that one. Julian, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, Julian seems like she's not responding right now. That's, oh, can hello? You, can you hear me? There yes. you are. <laughs> Hi. Um, so uh, for, for the overall uh, conference for the first two days, the event is capped at 600 attendees. However, um, the number of handouts that you have for your session depends on uh, the room that your session is placed in. So uh, very soon we will be um, letting you know what your room assignments are, which will also contain um, the capacity for the room, which will give you an idea of how many uh, handouts um, or resources you should have available for your particular session. Also, um, I wanted to share too that if, if possible, um, some handouts, you may need physical copies of them because you want people to interact with them or fill something out or whatever. If there are handouts that are just a resource that you want people to walk away with, we would prefer that we make those available digitally and, and we're figuring out the best way to do that. But just to save paper and make it easily accessible to people even once they leave the conference, um, digital versions, um, and, and links to those resources, we'll also want to want to share those. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I'm going to actually just go in order because these are coming in at a pretty pretty uh, easy rate here. So Maria Brindlemeyer, uh, once again, thank you. Um, she asks, are there multiple Ignite Talks running in parallel rooms? So in a single session block, might there be multiple Ignite Talk sessions happening? Yes, the answer is yes. The Ignite Talk format was a really uh, popular format that people chose to um, propose. And so, you know, not looking at the schedule in front of me, but, you know, during any 60-minute session block, there could be one room where there's four Ignite Talks happening, then there's another breakout room, there could be another four happening, another breakout room, there could be another four. So you could have at any point up to, you know, maybe even over 15 Ignite Talks uh, happening simultaneously across the conference. Yeah, I agree. It was a very popular format. I think that's going to make for some really dynamic sessions, so that's the good news. The other good news is that a lot of you will be able to attend each other's Ignite Talk sessions, which is pretty fun as well. Um, Irina Kudinko asks, do we have any tips to build in a high-speed interaction with the audience? Yeah, we have lots of tips, um, and we can send some of that out as, as well um, when this webinar is over. We have, you know, five or six different large audience engagement techniques 
that work with people who are sitting theater style. Because if any of you have given presentations or facilitated or tried to engage an audience, you know, how the room is set up in part determines what you can actually do with the audience. So uh, we actually started this webinar, if you remember, with a polling question. Um, and we also asked people to start thinking about like what comments they want to share at a certain point in the presentation. And we did that on purpose because it was a short little poll to gauge from you all in the audience how much experience you have with the, uh, with the format. So that gave us information. We then also knew that there were six, seven, or eight of you that do have actually given an Ignite talk. And so I prepared you and said, at a certain point in the presentation, I'm going to turn to you to give your own thoughts. And then we were able to turn to those tips and best practices that you all came up with at the end. So those were a couple techniques that we modeled in this kind of virtual format that can be replicated in a room um, you know, where people are sitting in a, in a large theater style audience. So um, thanks for that question, because we will send that out. I will also say that, like I said earlier, we will have facilitators assigned to each Ignite Talk session. So when it comes to engaging the audience before your talk begins, you can lean on the facilitator to do that in terms of like, you know, where to be in the room, the volume, when to like close out the conversation, how to summarize what was seen in the audience. You know, that's a lot of work, and if, if you want to do that for your talk and you feel comfortable doing that before and after your talk, by all means, you should do that. But if you're not and you don't want to spend energy doing that, playing that facilitation role, um, a facilitator will be working with you all to do that work. And also, providing that transition. So, like, once one person is done with their Ignite talk and then the next person's lined up ready to go, we want to keep it on time, we want to keep things rolling. We want to introduce that person, draw some connections so it makes sense why this next Ignite talk is coming. The facilitator is there to do that. I also think it might be a good moment to address how the structure of the 60-minute session would work, um, if you want to elaborate on that at all. Or... Sure, yeah, no, that's a good, good question. So um, let's say you're in uh, a session where there are four Ignite talks. You're, you're one of four Ignite talks that have been grouped together. How it's going to work is um, the facilitator will open up the session, um, you know, with the title and, and what, what's the theme that's tying all these Ignite talks together, um, engage the audience in some way um, for, you know, three minutes. Then they'll introduce the first uh, presenter. That presenter will give her or his talk. And then at the end, the facilitator will engage the audience to get their reactions, reflections on what they just heard from that Ignite talk. That will then lead into the second Ignite talk. Um, and then that person will speak and present for six minutes, 40 seconds, and then there'll be engagement with the audience after that one for five or so minutes, um, so on and so forth. So if you do the math and each Ignite talk is, again, six and a half, seven minutes long, you realize that if there are four um, there, that's 28 minutes, basically 30 minutes. Um, that leaves 30 minutes of time for the audience to talk with each other, respond to what they're seeing, react, actually have discussion, but that's happening in between each Ignite Talk. It's not all Ignite Talks happening 30 minutes straight, followed by 30 minutes of discussion. It's broken up um, throughout. Awesome. So there's a few questions that are linked here. So uh, Jennifer Johnson and Deanna and Katie Detko had all had questions about working with the other people that they are presenting with and also um, what kind of opportunities they will have to work with conference organizers to develop those sessions, given that there are multiple Ignite Talks in one. Right, right. Yes. So. If I'm understanding the, the questions um, I can rephrase correctly. It. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, so all of you should have received an email several days ago, a few days ago, um, asking if you would like support in designing your session. Um, because we realize that, you know, particularly if you are grouped with other individuals, you may not know those individuals, you may not be familiar with their topic or their talk, and so all right, how, how is this going to work? You know, the question naturally that, that arises. 
So um, we sent out um, an email that asked you if you if you wanted support to kind of coordinate and and um, have a thought partner in how that grouping is going to make the most sense for you and the other presenters. So if you did request support there, um, you uh, someone from the session design committee has been assigned to your uh, session, and they will be reaching out to you directly. And again, their role is as a thought partner. Um, so if you need to rewrite the title of your session um, after having spoken with your other presenters and you think, well, actually, I think this is a more appropriate title and this is a more appropriate description that speaks to what we um, are actually going to be addressing, but we want a thought partner to help us think through that. Or what are the connections that tie all of our talks together? That may not be immediately apparent to you and the three other presenters that you're grouped with, but thought did go into that when you were grouped together. So the committee that put the schedule together, they already do have some ideas around why they thought it made sense for certain talks to be grouped together. So the person who has been assigned to your session and will be supporting you, they might have some ideas on, on how to create that um, uh, kind of continuous or connected theme that ties all the, the, the topics together. Um, and then same with audience engagement. Um, if you are figuring out, okay, what's a, what's a prompt or what's a question um, that I can use to start my talk to get the audience interested? Uh, what's something I can do after my talk is over to gauge what people are taking away and learning? If you want support on, on how to structure those quick interactive um, engagement with the audience, they're there to be a thought partner for that as well. And again, I'll reiterate that you'll have a facilitator in the room who will be able to to actually do that facilitation if, if you would like. Great. And then, Katie, I see your question is a little, it's, it's related to this. Um, Katie was asking whether the order of Ignite Talks within the one-hour session is set or whether that needs to be determined. And it's really up to you. And in conjunction, you can work with your point of contact, uh, your thought partner, if you support, ask for support. Um, we're leaving that up to you. At some point, we will probably need to know the order so the facilitator can can do that well and do that effectively. Um, we are going to be bringing the facilitators in a little bit later in the process, probably, I'm thinking, in March. Darren, is that correct? Probably yeah. in March? Yeah. Um, so that will be someone who's coming in once things are a little more fleshed out within your session. Um, question, again, from Maria, just to clarify about the format for a group of Ignite Talks, is it correct that we select our facilitator and then each of the Ignite Talks has one speaker? Uh, each Ignite Talk does have one speaker. The facilitator is going to be provided for you, unless you have someone who's very, very comfortable in that role. Yeah. And in yeah. that case, please indicate this yeah, 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 <laughs> so exactly, we know. Exactly. What we want to avoid is, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a delicate um, skill of moving a session along that involves multiple people. What we really want to avoid is one presenter in your session actually not talking for six minutes and 40 seconds, but going on for 15 minutes. And no one is there or comfortable or knows whose role it is to put it, bring an end to it because there are others in the session that are sharing that time and space. So that, that's a heavy load that I think some people are comfortable taking on, um, others are not. I, again, we just felt it was important to have professional facilitators who do this time and time again to make sure that every presenter knows, you know, when it's time to transition and how to do that, like, smoothly and seamlessly and professionally. Um, we also want to avoid just constant talking for 30 straight minutes. Um, we need to bring in the audience engagement because, again, that's what the research tells us is going to increase retention, relevance, um, levels of energy in the room. We don't want people falling asleep. I mean, this is the balance. There's a lot of interesting content, stories, lessons learned, best practices that folks who are coming to this conference want to share. And then there's also the pedagogy, right? So we said that at the beginning of this, of this webinar is that when we marry content with pedagogy, that is what equals learning, and we don't want the pedagogy to, to kind of get lost in the mix here, um, and that's, that's where a facilitator can, can come in. So to Shira's point, if, if you or someone in your session that you're grouped with 
is a facilitator and wants to play that role, by all means, have that person play that role and let us know that. Um, if you are in a session where all of you feel like let somebody else take on that load, we on the TRG side, we have the, the, the staff to provide that support. And for those who don't, aren't aware of who we are, TRG stands for Training Resources Group. Um, facilitation is our business. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is what we do. Um, turning here to Michelle's question um, of who will be advancing the slides every 20 seconds. Great question. Yeah, so um, there's a way to design your, your PowerPoint presentation, your Ignite Talk. Um, using PowerPoint, obviously. There's a link to that in the online resources. Uh, if you look on your screen, the bottom left-hand side, I believe it's called um, the Ignite Talk PowerPoint How-To Video. That walks you through how to create a timed and automated PowerPoint presentation. So you can create it where the slides automatically uh, progress every 20 seconds. So that video shows you how to do that. That's what we recommend doing because that's what's going to keep us all honest. Um, in full transparency, like even in this webinar, um, I was manually scrolling through um, and I took a little liberties on some of those slides, right? Because I was like, oh, I can take an extra five seconds or I can take an extra 10 seconds. Um, and that's when things can get sloppy. And all of a sudden, my six-minute, 40-second talk becomes eight minutes, and then the next person's becomes 10 minutes. And I actually think part of the fun of an Ignite Talk is that you are following something that, once you hit start, is automated. Um, and it guarantees that you keep your message tight and focused, as was um, recommended earlier, and it means that your talk will be six minutes and 40 seconds long. And that allows the facilitators and all of you as a group of, 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 um, of Ignite Talk presenters to guarantee that the time is shared equally across um, all talks. So that's what we recommend is to design your Ignite Talk with the automated um, slide function at play. Um, but you can also have a clicker. You can also have somebody who you know, uh, the facilitator can be clicking through, but I think the best option, what we recommend, is to have it be automated. Yes. And Jennifer, to your point, sounds like our presentation should be sent in PowerPoint um, and not another presentation software like Google Slides. Yes, please. Um, I believe we'll have space. There's a space for this to be uploaded on your, um, your profile through the form that you've been using with your your session. Um, so there's going to be a place, and this might be a good time, well, at the end we'll turn to some, some dates and deadlines, but there is a space for you to upload that presentation in PowerPoint, and you can bring it on a USB drive as well the day of. Um, we do not recommend that you use a, an internet-based like software or app. Uh, because our ability to use Wi-Fi is quite limited. So we would much rather it be in PowerPoint form. Um, that is correct. <laughs> um, there were two questions here. Oh, well, we have, I see Maria also asked, building on that PowerPoint question, will you have a format for the PowerPoint, um, like a wide format or a square format? I yeah. think that's up to you. Yeah, it's up to um, you. I, that's the other thing, too, is like, you know, we have. Oh, Julene, yes. <laughs> Yes, um, there, we will actually have um, parameters for the, the slide so, uh, sizes um, that we will also be sharing with you based on uh, the audiovisual requirements for the venue. Okay. Do we? Do we that yeah. Yep. Is that a 16 by 9 or what's the, uh, the ratio? Um, it'll be 16 by 9. Okay. Okay. So 16 by 9, so everybody knows. Um, there's a couple questions, Julie, and I'm going to ask you to stay on because there were two questions about the actual venue. Uh, one from Doug Perkins who asked, can we set the monitor screen to presentation view so that we can see the notes on each slide while they're being projected? So that goes to the AV capabilities, um, Julie. 
Yes, you can. Awesome. And then Maria had a question of whether all the presenters would be sitting up on a podium at the same time while each speaker stands up and gives their presentation, or is it going to be one presenter at a time up on stage and the others sitting in, off to the side or in the front row? Um, the, all the presenters will be in the front of the room together. Um, you will either be on a raised platform uh, at a panel table or in uh, chairs in front of the room. It depends on which room you're assigned to. Um, and any facilitators would be in the front row. Uh, so all of the presenters in the, in, in the front of the room and any facilitators sit, seated in the front row or moderators. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Johnson has a question. If they have, if the presenter has video looping in the background for part of the talk, is that okay? Um, if, for example, they're doing it to show that how their platform works and the speaker's talking through it like an animation. Yeah. Awesome. Are there any other questions before we before we move out, I see someone's typing here, <laughs> before we move into talking about some upcoming deadlines. Nope, looks like no one's typing. You can also still put the questions in. We can always follow up with some emails. Um, so some upcoming deadlines that you as presenters should know about. Next week, February 9th. That is the last day for you and your co-presenters to register for the conference. On February 10th, it will be opening to others. We cannot then guarantee a spot for you. So that's there. February 24th is the final day for you, the presenters, to book hotel rooms if you need them. Um, that link is up on the GEC, or the Global Education Conference um, page on EduLinks, which we should and can make available to you. Along those lines, for your presentations themselves, February 28th, we ask that you and your co-presenters decide on the final session title and the final description of the session. And we ask that you add that to your profile that you've been working in. Um, it's the one where you could request support, I believe, and Julie, correct me if I'm wrong. We also ask that you upload a preliminary version of your presentation, um, and I believe each presenter in a session is able to upload their own PowerPoint. And so we ask this because we are going to see if anyone needs extra assistance uh, with their PowerPoint. And we also want to make sure that you are on track to be ready for the conference. And finally, on March 20th, so about a month later, we do ask that your final PowerPoint for your Ignite Talk is uploaded to that platform. And we ask this so that we can be prepared to have it in our system for the conference starting on April 6th. Um, I do see one question that just came in from Katie. If we did request support via the form, when should we expect to hear back from a session guide? And I don't know if Julian, I, it should be this week, I would think, but Julian, I don't know if you want to have more I, insight there. Yes, I, I would say within in the next uh, day or two, you should hear back. Um, I did want to say something about the um, request the the session update form, though, um, because some folks are starting the process um, where they're asking questions for support, but they're not actually submitting the form. So we have several incomplete um, support requests um, within our database right now. So if you have started a support request but didn't hit submit and and get that in or you you think you did just go back um, and log in and um, and make sure you get that in if you're unsure if you did or not uh, just send me an email and I, I can let you know that um, but uh, you should be hearing that from your um, support guide um, in the next few days <clears throat> uh, also I just wanted to mention that um, that session update form is also where you would uh, make any changes to your co-presenters. I, I know that a lot of you, um, the names are different from 
um, what was on your initial initial call for proposals application. So if you have changed co-presenters um, since being notified, um, please make sure that you um, make that change in that session update form as well. Thanks, Julian. I see one more person, a couple of people typing here. Um, oh, here from Kevin Hardy, we have a question. If we're part of a merged session and the lead speaker or point of contact has changed, is there a way to change that primary point of contact in the form so we don't miss any emails from everyone, like the session support email? And I'm going to kick that to Julene as well. Yes. Um, so um, the uh, many of the, the notifications uh, to this point have been going to um, the lead contact um, on your proposal application. Um, we have gotten some individual email requests to change who that person is um, because some of the folks who submitted the proposals are not actually the people who will be um, presenting um, at, um, at this point. So if you need to uh, change that, yes, please do that within the form and indicate in the notes section um, who, um, who you want to, uh, to be included in, in email notifications and we'll make sure that that uh, person is included as well. Totally muted, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> we were muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, since questions are slowing down um, in the chat box, we would love to know one thing that you are going to take away from this webinar as you move forward with your session design. So I will let you do that and type that into the chat box here. While you are doing that, Doug Perkins had a question as well. Uh, I have two colleagues who were waitlisted. When will they find out if their presentations are accepted or not? Um, Julene, I will let you take that one. <laughs> Oops. We're uh, told that if their proposal was moved from the waitlist onto the program, they would receive an, a secondary notification last week. And if you didn't receive that notification, that means that that did not happen. So if your two colleagues did not receive that secondary notification, then their proposals were not moved onto the program. Thanks, Julian. And to your point, uh, Doug, posters, we actually have limited space for them. So it does seem like it's an easy format to accommodate. We are limited by the constraints of the venue on that. So. Unfortunately, that was a consideration we had to take into account. I really appreciate everyone's comments about their takeaways. <laughs> Darren, I don't know if you want to add anything before we move on to the last slide here. Um, no, I, th I think the thing, I'm just really excited for you all. I mean, I've, I've organized and participated in a couple Ignite Talk or Pachakacha nights, and it, it, it's really, it, it can be really festive because there is, like I said earlier, a performance aspect to it where people appreciate not only the content that you're sharing, but also the effort that you as a presenter put into making a you know tight, concise, well-rehearsed presentation. And I think everybody walks out of that, um, again, kind of like um, energized around what's being shared. And so what I'll I encourage you all to do just to get a sense of what what these Ignite Talk um, sessions um, can create. If you go to, um, again, the bottom left-hand corner of your screen under the online resources, um, there's the official Pachakacha website. And so you can actually go and see where all of these Pachakacha events um, are happening and, again, conferences, bars, coffee shops all over the world. You can see a ton of um, examples of these um, Ignite Talks. So you can see how well or how not well people do some of these talks, but there's this massive library of talks. And um, I mean, if you geek out on this stuff, you could spend hours on this website. 
just seeing all these Ignite talks that have been happening all over the world. So I think that's a, a good thing to inspire you to, to increase your motivation for embracing this format. And then also the article that I'll recommend um, you check out is called um, Hate Long Rambling Speeches, Try Pachakacha. It was a NPR story from 2010. And this was actually the story that I heard on the radio that turned me on to this, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And so it tells you a little bit about the history, about how this format came to be and how it's kind of just taken the world by storm. So I think that's another interesting thing to um, kind of increase your motivation and get some context behind it. So yeah, I'll just say I'm, I'm glad that you all have jumped on board with this. I think you all will have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I agree. I also want to point out in the downloadable resources uh, box that is next to your chat box, we have this PowerPoint that you can download in case you missed anything or want to go back to anything. We have Darren's uh, template, like the presentation script template that he used for his Ignite Talk slash Pachakucha that he gave earlier for your use. Um, and we also have the session format toolkit, which you all know and love. It is specifically for the Ignite Talk. So please do download those. And my final question to you is, on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with delivering at Ignite Talk now that we've gone through our preliminary webinar? So I will leave you with that. Please answer in the poll box below. And if you have any remaining questions, uh, do go ahead and type those in. <laughs> but otherwise, thank you so much for attending. Uh, Shira, um, there are one or two joining by phone who are unable to um, type in chats. Uh, so you can also feel free, if you were joining by phone, to send an email. Yes. And we can answer that after the webinar. And I will. Uh, yes. If you are joining by phone, the email that you will want to send your questions to is gfu at usaid.gov. And I will put that up on oops, the screen right here. Uh, please feel free to keep answering the poll. <laughs> and any last questions in the chat or email gfu at usaid.gov. Thank you to everybody. Good luck. <laughs> We look forward to seeing your preliminary PowerPoint.